I think we can start. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this morning's show and tell. I think we are halfway through our show and tells. Um, if we could jump to the next slide, please. So uh, flexible heat networks. So decarbonisation of heat, um, as we know, is a major challenge on the journey to net zero, um, with heat being one of the major demands on um, the system. So flexible heat works are set to be one of the ways which we will um, look to meet the challenges surrounding this. And uh, this round of discovery projects has generated some really exciting work um, in the space. So today you will see uh, presentations from Kano uh, Gas Plant led by SGN, uh, Heatropolis, which is um, led by SGN also, and is a study based on a King's Cross um, model using data to maximize the use of electricity network, oh sorry, network capacity, and Full Circle um, led by UKPN, which is a framework to recover heat from energy network transformers. Um, and finally, uh, Net Zero Community Energy Hubs, which was led by SGN, and this is about a model to control the system to accelerate the rollout of affordable low carbon heat using um, hubs. So without further ado, we'll, um, we'll crack on with the agenda. Next slide, please. So yeah, so we our first, our first uh, project today is um, Kano Gas Plant, followed by a quick Q&A about five minutes, and then we'll move on to Heatropolis, followed by another Q&A. We'll then jump to a 10 minute break, um, and then we'll have full circle, another Q&A, and net zero community energy hubs. And so each pre presentation um, will be led by the lead networks. You ha have these listed here, and without, um, and we'll have our Q&A session um, in the, in the Q&A, so please do drop your questions in um, so that we can have some good discussion around these projects um, following their presentations. So um, we'll just crack on now and I will hand over. Next slide. Over to you. Uh, hi, um, could we go to the next slide, please? Hi, I'm Chris Taylor. I'm Technical Development Director at Vital Energy, and I'm going to be talking about the Kano gas plant. Uh, the partners within this project were, it was SGN as lead partner, um, Vital Energy, looking at the uh, technical aspects of the um, generation plant, Imperial College London doing some whole system modelling, University of Birmingham focusing on um, compression and, and liquefaction, and then uh, two councils, Glasgow City Council and Western Berkshire Council, who were giving uh, a perspective on the potential use of, of the technology within their areas. Next slide, please. Okay, so the, the problem, um, as, as we're going towards net zero, there's been sort of se several models done, including ones by Imperial College that look at what the, the future network is going to need. Um, so there's an established requirement for import and export flexibility within the network, such as provided by batteries. Um, there's still expected to be a need for open cycle gas turbine plants and combined cycle turbine plants um, in 2050 for extended periods of low renewable generation. Um, there's going to be a need for demand side only flexibility as ex hours of excess generation increase. Um, that's coming from National Grid. If you look at their modeling and some of their future energy scenarios, the suggestion is, uh, so as of today, we currently have um, longer periods of uh, excess demand than we do of excess generation. But as we start to um, effectively over install wind power, um, there's going to be increasing periods of um, over generation on, on the grid and therefore an increasing need for demand side only response, um, which doesn't have the requirements such as a battery does to put that power back onto the grid. Um, and there's going to be need for um, decarbonisation of sort of higher temperature heat, which is also part of the solution. Um, all of the above activities are important, but if you consider them completely in isolation, then you might end up with sort of single function assets, which um, cease to cease operating if, as the market changes over sort of the coming years and decades. You can end up with higher CO2 production from flexibility. 
um, and that increase the amount of the infrastructure, both at transmission and distribution level for both power and gas. And then you're going to have increased timescales of connecting um, these flexible assets, including heat networks, onto these grids. Um, next slide, please. So um, what our project does is it looks at decoupling the compression cycle of a gas turbine from the time of generation. So what a gas turbine does is it has a um, turbine on one end, which is the, the work generator, the power generator. And then that drives, that sort of directly drives a compressor at the time of use. So when the turbine's running, it sucks in um, ambient air. Um, compresses that down which increases its pressure and temperature and then combusts that with um, natural gas gas natural gas uh, and then sends that through a sends that hot pressurized gas through a turbine which is connected to a generator which produces electricity what that means is that sort of circa 50 percent of the work done by the turbine is to drive that compressor and when you're producing power with um, gas you know, natural gas in, in the sort of majority current case, then 50% of that gas is being used to drive the compressor. Um, that leads to uh, sort of, yeah, CO2 emissions related to the compression cycle. So what our project is doing is looking at replacing the compression cycle with a liquefaction process. Um, what the modeling shown is that can reduce the gas consumption by 50% which obviously reduces the CO2 emissions if you're using natural gas and it minimizes H2 hydrogen consumption if you're using hydrogen in future energy scenarios. Um, it also means, so for example, with open cycle gas plants, I think the utilization of those in these future energy scenarios is going to be low. There'll be a low number of hours for these sort of periods of extended um, uh, ex extended low renewables generation. Um, it's therefore not particularly economical to gather the excess heat that those um, produce either through um, you know heat recovery into a steam turbine or, or into a network because they themselves are so are so intermittent um, what this process allows you to do is to alternate the size between the the gas plant uh, the actual generation plant and the the liquefaction process so you can have whilst the generator might be working for a low number of hours um, or a reduced number of hours in the year the the actual liquefaction liquefaction process which generates the heat can then be used um, for an increased number of hours which makes gathering that heat and, and using it in useful situations um, more achievable next slide please uh, so the users of this technology, um, high temperature heat users, as, as we said, the, the liquefaction process has the ability to generate higher, higher temperatures of heat than would be seen by a heat pump, for example, or achievable efficiently by a heat pump. And that's one of the key difficult areas for um, heat decarbonization. There's one which I think I've covered up with the, the picture here, but one of the users is um, uh, the, the flexible asset owner and what they'll be left with is a, a, an asset which is more flexible and more able to respond to future changes to the the um, the network um, with a more diverse business case and the electrical grid is going to provide them with with storage and flexible generation and also increase the amount of demand side only response um, through this sort of flexible asset next slide please Okay, so the project activities we did, uh, we modeled the project using software called Plexos. This is an optimization engine and it's used by the national grid um, to model uh, network growth. Um, we used the model to look at a number of different um, scenarios and, and ratios and try to understand what the, the optimal balance really between the size of the liquefaction plant, the amount of storage you'd need, and then the size of the, the generator. Uh, what the modeling allows us to do is to simulate real world trading scenarios over multiple markets. So that's day ahead, uh, balancing mechanism, intraday. So actually the model runs um, multiple different scenarios which are laid on top of each other. So that's a much more realistic um, uh, modeling of it than compared to some of the, the other modeling which um, we've done currently. Uh, to do this, we used 25-year um, forecast data for all of those markets, which were provided by Beringa. 
and then we modeled um as i said we we modeled full 25 year for for the plant using that data and also using some um, gas pricing data also provided by Beringa. Uh, we wanted to model the heat recovery for this um we wanted to pick a a project or um, something that we had a lot of detailed data on um, in terms of sort of half hourly ideally data uh, for both heat and, and power as well and we wanted that to be a higher temperature user um, so a lot of the networks that um, vital energy currently provide heat for um, our hospitals and because of their distribution networks a lot of them are steam distribution and they have these high high central temperatures um, what the modeling showed was that uh, the heat demand for on site was higher than the demand for um, sorry the the heat demand results showed an excess of cryogenic air which was produced if you were trying to meet the heat demand um, so what we were trying to initially look at was whether these things could be based next to a site um, which allowed us to better access the the heat um, for use there however what we showed was that yes you know we could meet the demands of, of the site but then if you had an on-site generator then to meet their power demands using the the technology described above to be uh, an excess of, of cryogenic air was, that was produced so we looked at having um, an off-site solution as well and we found that ratios of Sort of five between five to one and ten to one between the liquefaction plant and the generator was about right. So um, five to one being if you had a fifty megawatt generator offsite, you would have a ten megawatt import liquefaction plant. We actually looked at three different scenarios. One which was um, how this would run just out of interest if none of the heat was recovered and whether that was commercially viable using the um, uh, using the numbers that we had. And in fact, that actually showed that that did run. Um, we modeled a central site only scenario whereby it would be connected to a sort of larger district heating network from a, a centralized 50 megawatt plant. And we also looked at, as I said, this, this offsite potential solution. And then we looked into the ability to, to potentially transport the cryogenic air from the site where the heat was being used to the central location for generation. Next slide, please. Um, so in terms of the major equipment specification, when we were looking at the turbine cycle, we produced an Excel version of the turbine cycle and we looked at varying the pressure ratios, inlet temperatures, um, uh, inlet pressures and the number of stages to see what the, the optimum use is. Um, and we found uh, we used recuperation of the gas turbine exhaust to preheat the what is cold um, air coming from the uh, coming from the liquid air, the cryogenic air storage, it going into the, the turbine. What that meant is that that's beneficial in that the, the exhaust heat produced by the gas turbine at the point of generation um, can be also used at the point of generation. And the we don't have to then connect that into a, a heat network and, and there aren't as many losses because obviously, as I said before, recovering that heat in a normal open cycle gas turbine um, process because of how intermittent it is isn't particularly cost effective. Uh, we had a strong desire to repurpose of existing equipment, both A, we didn't want to be designing new turbo generators and, and B, it would give us the potential to look at this thing for a retrofit type solution of existing open cycle gas turbines. Uh, and in the end, we selected a two stage process whereby you pump up the cryogenic air to high pressures. In this case, we chose uh, 120 bar. You send that, uh, you, you heat that slightly to about um, 500 degrees C and send that through an expander down to about 30 bar and then send that into a um, normal gas turbine combustor and, and expansion process. Uh, we looked at um, we looked at all those different scenarios for a fixed amount of inlet air. So I had a fixed size of um, liquefaction process, and the estimated cost for this was uh, for this sixty six megawatt um, export was with a ten megawatt import liquefaction plant was under thirty million, which is um, in and around the cost of an open cycle gas turbine, which would also export sixty six megawatts. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we looked at the whole system impact of this using Imperial College's whole system, whole energy system model. What that did was that uh, had 
a counterfactual which was didn't use the technology at all and and the the case that we were looking for which was assuming 15 gigawatts of of Carnot gas plant being available to the system to use and it operated the Carnot gas plant on the hydrogen um, they used the net zero leading the way scenario and their deep electrification of heat um, scenario for this and it compares the generation mix to distribution and transmission costs for all these. What that showed was there was a 2.9 billion pound a year benefit to the system, which comes from 1.3 billion savings of low carbon generation, 1.2 billion a year in distribution network reinforcements and 0.5 billion a year in the hydrogen system. Um, what the graphs on the right show is how that is um, achieved. So what happens is what when the Carnot gas plant is available, there's a displacement of the hydrogen powered open cycle gas turbines and the hydrogen um, combined cycle gas turbines. Uh, you can't quite see the numbers on, on this one there, but effectively it takes about 50% of, it's about 50% split. So you end up with um, about seven gigawatts replacement of the combined cycle and seven gigawatts replacement of the, the open cycle. Next slide, please. So the findings, uh, what we found was that the um, Kano gas plant, which includes the turbine generator liquefaction plant and the storage has a comparable capex to equivalent size GT. Uh, it also provides a 50% reduction in the gas consumption per megawatt generated by the open cycle gas turbine that's at the point of, of generation and, and doesn't include for anything on the um, on the liquefaction side. Uh, it's suitable for either natural gas or, or hydrogen. Um, so we can evolve as, as the um, energy market evolves. Uh, the liquefaction process can be optimized and designed to match process conditions. So you can look at altering the, the compression cycles and the pressure ratios to produce a different temperature. Was it effectively cooling on the um, cooling of the liquefaction process? Uh, a small on-site turbine could provide some um, power demand although some would have to be transported off-site in, the, in that version of the model. Um, and a large off-site gas plant um, acts as a peaking plant, replacing, as I mentioned before, open cycle gas turbines and combined cycle. Uh, as the cryogenic air is, is so dense, um, it is suitable for transport from this distributed site to a central location. What we found for a 10 megawatt um, import, there was about 25 traffic movements um, per day. Uh, in terms of return on investment, that was provided for all of the cases, um, even the case where there's no heat, um, which is recovered at all. I just the liquefaction plant runs when the demand price is, uh, the energy pricing is is low enough, wastes the heat because in, in that case, there's, there's no way to use it, and then burns the gas and uses the, the liquefied air when the power prices are higher. Um, and we can also found that this was very well suited for using existing equipment, either repurposing something new or retrofitting something old. Next slide, please. In terms of the next steps, um, firstly, we're going to need to look at the preferred turbine and expander, which we would like to use in the, the beta stage. So the alpha stage will act really as a, as a, as a front end engineering design process for what would be the, the beta phase. Um, we're going to look more into the value of recuperation and see if additional capex investment um, makes sense. So what we did was we tried to reduce the cost of the the recuperator um, by reducing the heat exchanger effectiveness. So increasing the heat exchanger effectiveness recovers more of the heat coming from the turbine exhaust and reduces the amount of gas, so it improves the gas efficiency. And there'll be a balance there between the utilization of the asset and um, how much it's worth spending on, on that recuperation cycle. And that will change from sort of different business cases, but we'll do um, a more detailed assessment of that in the next stage. As I said, we're gonna do a front end engineering design. Um, this will be of the proposed commercial product with a liquefaction plant um, on site somewhere at, with a small turbine and an offsite storage and turbines. Um, what we think we'll do for the beta stage is just focus on the uh, an on-site smaller liquefaction plant located with a small turbine that should demonstrate the commercial and technical functionality of the of the whole process um, and demonstrate that an off-site process is possible but obviously does so at a smaller size and, and with a reduced investment requirement uh, we're going to select the location for the the beta project from which we'll develop from 
again, as I said, that'll be a, a smaller site with a smaller turbine, and we'll look for something with a heat demand. Uh, ideally, someone we're already involved with, such as um, a hospital or a, um, a university. Um, and we'll provide details to the Net Zero Community Energy Hubs project, um, which I'll be talking on later, in terms of how the kind of gas plant could form part of one of those hubs and interact with other flexible assets within a, um, a sort of small location. Um, and that's the end of the presentation. Thank you. Right. Um, so we're going to move on to Q&A now. Um, five or so minutes of Q&A. Um, I'm just going to bring open the Q&A box. So this question is from Rob. Um, in terms of locating these plants, has consideration been given to co-location with flexible uses of heat? Um, he's thinking things like sugar refining, um, something that might be able to use heat um, if and when it's available. Uh, yes. Um... To be honest, the focus has been on uh, heat users that, that we know, i.e. existing clients of, of Vital Energy for which we have heat and power solutions on, on their site. There's a need for a, a kind of something that replaces the, the CHP um, and, and is, is the sort of um, can provide both power and, and heat to replace that. Um, those are sort of let's say flexible heat users what we looked at was putting flexibility within the the heat generation in the form of um some storage and then trying to meet the demands of the the um the users when they arrive so in the case i think in one of the slides shown what we had was a, a full um half hourly heat profile for one of the hospitals and then we looked at making sure we met that that profile with the the heat capture from the liquefaction plant and associated storage there's no reason why it couldn't be co-located with something like um a sugar refining plant the the thing you have to balance really is the demands of the the grid and kind of the pricing of the of the power and the demands of the of the plant if you've got the liquefaction plant looking like it would ideally want to run at times of um, increased generation and low pricing on the, the grid and that doesn't match up with the heat demands of the, the end user then you end up looking at increasing amount of heat storage. I think there's lots of, of people out there both sort of public sector um, commercial processes which have a, a fairly constant heat demand. Um, we have clients now who are looking to decarbonize their heating but you know if they have anything above 90 degrees C then suddenly including a heat pump doesn't Look as, look as attractive because the efficiencies reduced quite quite considerably. Um, so what we were looking at here was something that could potentially meet those um, higher temperature demands. And because they're incorporated in another wider system, not directly there solely to serve the, the, um, the, the heat needs, um, there are efficiencies, the commercial efficiencies that can be gained. And we can we think we're in a, a pretty good position to provide people, certainly the modeling shows are in a good position to provide these customers with decarbonized heat at a lower price than they would be able to get otherwise. I hope that answers the question. Uh, that's great. Thanks, Chris. Uh, we do have a little bit longer if anyone else wants to put um, a question or two in. No. Okay, I think that was all of the questions um, that were there. Um, so we're running a little bit of ahead of schedule, but we um, will move on. If you um, if you do have any more questions for um, Chris, I'm sure he'll be very much happy to answer them. Absolutely. Thanks. Great. So I think believe I believe it's the UKPM project next. Good morning. My name's Matt Osborne. I'm from Passive UK and I'm here with my colleague Bruce Gerald from Metropolitan and we're going to present our show and tell for the discovery phase of the Heatropolis project. Next slide please. And the next slide please. So um, decarbonisation of heat is clearly one of the most important challenges for the energy transition. So to move to net zero, most heating and hot water systems in buildings will need to move away from fossil fuels. 
and replacing fossil fuel systems with heat pumps will have major implications for electricity networks. Heat networks will also play a critical role in the transition, uh, particularly in dense urban areas. The image in the right shows a concentration of areas with the highest heat demand across the UK. Um, existing heat networks wanting to move away from using fossil fuels present us with a near-term challenge to realise heat decarbonisation and understanding and improving processes for transitioning these sites also provides a valuable opportunity for learning. Next slide, please. Heatropolis is essentially a multi-stage decision framework. The aim of the framework is to unlock commercial mechanisms that link smarter heat network designs with power system planning processes. Uh, our basic hypothesis is that smarter heat network designs and operational practices will deliver significant peak electrical load reductions for DNOs. The process we're looking to follow is relatively simple, it's outlined in, in the diagram here. We start by looking at heat network design options, we evaluate and model how they would operate, and we look at projected electrical load, peak load profiles that they produce. We then develop a power model to project the uptake of demand across the DNO area, and then we assess the cost implications that improved electrical loads could have from better management of the heat network. Um, we are looking to develop uh, this process through a use case based on the King's Cross heat network. The site is being built out at the moment and is due to reach full capacity in 2025. And like most large scale heat networks, the site currently relies on fossil fuel gas CHP systems uh, for heat and some power. The network owners have committed to phasing out the use of fossil fuel on the site by 2030. The existing plans that they've set out to achieve this, we use a combination of heat pumps and thermal storage, and these will significantly increase electrical loads across the site. So currently the heating system, the CHP, uh, is a producer of power, 1.5 megawatts, and the planned low carbon heat system could potentially peak up to 21 megawatts. Next slide, please. So the Heatropolis framework aims to improve cost efficiency by coordinating multiple stakeholders and decisions related to long-term infrastructure investments. Uh, the project will work with a range of stakeholders and has been working with a range of stakeholders to develop these processes, uh, particularly electricity network operators like UKPN who manage power and distribution systems and are planning their network reinforcements. They're looking at ways to improve investment strategies they'll need to transition to net zero. Heat network operators like Metropolitan controlling large scale infrastructure and assets looking to ways to deliver heat to their customers in a most cost effective way. They're interested in benefits for smarter designs that may reduce electrical loads from their site. Uh, there are technology providers like Passive, developing services to monitor and optimise low carbon technologies and local authorities like Camden Council, where the King's Cross network is located, who want to understand how to develop smarter heater networks and how this impl impacts their uh, local area energy plans. Next slide, please. So the aim of discovery was to compare how different low carbon heat network designs could, uh, and to help us understand what their impact would have on the DNO. And we did this through five key activities. We started by reviewing and validating the existing plans for the site. Um, then we investigated and shortlisted different options that are available for the heat network to manage their peak electrical loads. We looked then at uh, technical engineering requirements needed to realize a smarter and more managed electrical load and the next activity was to assess the impact that these different design solutions would have on DNO reinforcement planning. Finally we started to look at our, our alpha phase. Next slide please. First part of the project was looking at low carbon heat network designs for the site. Uh, the design process uh, started by building a model uh, using benchmarks for buildings this was then revised using smart using metered data from the site. 
This more calibrated model was then used to simulate heat demands for future build phases. Um, and then this could be looked at, uh, uh, we could develop a phase plan for implementation. We then moved to developing a short list of design scenarios to understand electrical loads on the site. And uh, this process is outlined on the right hand slide side of the slide here. So next slide, please. So the most important and perhaps complex stage of the project was modeling the outputs of different smart heat network design options that we shortlisted in the first part of the project. Part of this process was looking at how smart control technologies could be used to flatten heat loads across the site. We then carried out a large number of design iterations to generate a selection of options that we wanted to take further for further analysis. Uh, option one was basically the counterfactual design for the low carbon heat network on the site. This is currently the most commercially viable option, but as it's our baseline, it obviously only yields a 0% reduction in peak electrical demand. Option two would upgrade control technologies in the thermal stores so they better manage peak electrical loads. Counterfactual system otherwise prioritizes the use of heat pumps to charge the stores as this is the most cost effective way to generate heat. Option three looked at doubling the size of storage on the site using phase change materials that overcomes uh, some of the site con size constraints that we have. Um, obviously at a dense urban area, space is a premium. Um, option four combines option one to better manage on-site storage, but it also includes uh, smart controls to flatten peak demands across the site. Finally, option five uses smart storage, demand flattening, and upgrades the heat pump uh, capacity to take advantage of lower peak heat demands. Um, next stage of our modeling explores how these different design options and the impact that they would have on reinforcement plans for the DNO. And we found that if scaled across all of UKPN's area, uh, the smart heat network design options could avoid around 40 million pounds of reinforcement by 2050. Next slide, please. So what have we learned and how has our approach developed throughout discovery? Well, we know that low carbon heat networks are set to have an increasing impact on the electricity distribution system, but we can also see that there's a commercial disconnect between DNOs planning and heat network design and operation. So first of all, looking at the technical requirements, we can see that heat network designs are made in isolation and they only consider how to serve peak heat loads in the most cost efficient way. Currently, there's no commercial incentives for heat network designers to develop systems that reduce or manage uh, peak electrical loads uh, other than for their own cost efficiency. Um, however, we have identified that it's possible to adjust designs to lower peak loads by up to 50%. So in terms of power system modeling, our early analysis suggests that um, there are limitations in existing DNO projections looking at the impact for low carbon heat networks and we think there's a risk that higher reinforcement costs may be possible. As a result, there's an urgent need to understand how to foster ways to improve the impact of heat networks on the distribution system. So moving on to commercial mechanisms, we looked at existing commercial mechanisms such as the DSO flexibility and connection products, but they only provide very little return on investment for heat networks. Um, heat network DNO interaction currently only really considers peak electrical loads for the site. The timing of this load is calculated independently by the DNO as part of their diversity factors. And crucially, these calculations are not informed by any form of design agreement or contractual arrangement that could potentially specify when these loads occur. This means that both networks are effectively making long-term design decisions in isolation from each other, uh, which can only really lead to suboptimal cost outcomes. So for Alpha, we want to look at uh, these commercial mechanisms in more detail, and our options at the moment uh, include pre-agreed uh, energy performance-based contracting or long-term contract mechanisms between both infrastructures. Next slide, please. 
So in Alpha, we'll continue to focus on the two main functions of the framework, the technical requirements to design a heat network based on the King's Cross use case and commercial mechanisms to realize value from avoided reinforcement using smarter heat network designs. To test and validate this framework, we're planning to deliver four work streams. Firstly, a proof of concept smart control installation on a building on the site. This will help us to confirm our modeling assumptions and support better simulations of demand flattening across the site. Uh, second, we develop a detailed uh, design up to REBA 3 so we can procure a design build contractor for a beta demonstration. And third, we uh, outline the business case that we need to realize the value from avoided reinforcement. To do this, we need to update our power model projections and explore the different contractual options that are available. And this will help us to build a replicable, replicable framework that other heat networks and DNOs can use across the country. Finally, we develop a detailed beta plan and disseminate our findings. Thank you. Uh, that's that's everything from me. Can we move on to any questions, please? Um, I don't believe there are any questions in the Q and A. Um, I, I was sort of thinking um, this um, sort of how how you envisage the um, the regulatory model to sort of um, adapt to um, to this type of technology and um, and with that sort of something with the sort of the regulatory um, aspects is something you considered in the project. Yeah, so we we don't think there's any barriers specifically um, for on a regulatory side um, but obviously when we're looking at the contracting models we need to consider whether there are things that are going to undermine market competition we don't want it has to be a competitive process um, but equally it's about trying to make sure that long-term investment decisions are made so we think it's more of a service that the heat network potentially provide to the power system in terms of its its um, timed or managed profiles but at the moment that's just not a service or, or, or a uh, product that's available so again don't think there's regulatory barriers we, we are looking at that and potentially there, there's options for improved governance by third parties for example the dna uh, the ena or or, or off gem in, in this case so that's something again that we'll we'll need to explore as part of that um contractual mechanisms piece thanks so um there's another question here and uh, a couple of questions coming in. So is there a public facing element to this work? i uh, wondering if um, it could dovetail with some of the work they're developing in My Society's climate program on catalyzing in, um, community driven home energy improvements. So, so yeah. yeah, in terms of public facing, we, we are working with the local council for the site that's developing its local area energy plans. But in terms of sort of interaction with specific community groups and retrofit programs, I think it'd probably be limited because essentially it's it's looking at large scale infrastructure um, builds, particularly the, the power system and a large scale heat network that's potentially powering multiple thousands of homes uh, and industry across central London. Uh, so a question from David, when performing this type of modelling, how sensitive is the heat network distribution system performance to other developments, generation storage demand in the surrounding region? Did your modelling consider these factors? Uh, Bruce, that's maybe one for you. You're, you're the heat network expert. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, I think the, the impact of uh, generation and, and local storage outside of the heat network is not uh, a major impact on the, the heat network, but obviously has a significant impact on the way in which the energy, the electricity network planning goes. And I think that is an area where uh, the ability of the heat network to have a more um, open design discussion with the uh, uh, DNO so that they can fully understand how these elements will interact is a key part of the process we're trying to foster, um, we, we aren't able to model that directly. Um, obviously, local additional demands do have an impact on the way in which the heat network looks at uh, building out. One of the areas we're looking at 
um, actively, although outside of the Heatropolis system, is to what extent this network could expand. At the moment, it's limited by the physical uh, space on the site to, to, to look at capacity, but a, a sort of a flip side of improving the network uh, performance could be to release additional capacity at a later date. Again, it's not something we can directly model right now, but it's certainly a consideration. Right. Um, I don't see any more questions here. Um, I think now we are, if there's no more questions, we'll go um, a bit early to our break. Um, but um, the, the live Q&A will remain available if there are any um, further questions. Um, I'm sure the team will be happy to answer them. Um, so now I think, we'll, yeah, we'll go, we'll go to a break. Um, so we'll see you back here um, at, uh, sorry, I've got the time here. So yeah, we'll, you'll come back at um, 10.25, so a bit longer for a break than um, anticipated, but um, that's when we will kick off again with um, Full Circle. Thank you.
Right, so uh, welcome back everyone. Um, we'll now move on to our next UKPM project, which is Full Circle. Morning, everyone. I think we can go on to the first slide, if that's okay. Um, yeah, so good morning all. My name is Verona Mitchell. I'm a project lead at UK Power Network. I'm actually filling in today for my colleague, Sophia, uh, who is the lead, who can't be here today. Uh, and I'll be presenting alongside Yushin and Kayo, who are uh, project partners. Next slide, please. So like most industrial equipment, uh, electrical transformers lose some energy via heat. The lifespan of transformers uh, spans many decades. And of course, the older models produce more waste heat. Um, looking into making that heat useful is something that has been done in networks before. But there are two main issues with it. One is that normally where electrical power transformers are is not close anywhere near where heat might be required. And second of all, is it produces low grade waste heat. Uh, this project is looking at a specific area in Wandsworth. We've got a grid substation there, which has four 132 kV transformers, which are 200 meters away from an energy center. Um, the amount of waste heat produced at, from these transformers is actually very similar to the heat demand of the heat network. And because these transformers are going to be in situ for many years to come, there's a great opportunity to do something with that. I'm going to hand over to my colleague for the rest of the presentation. So, next slide, please. Thank you, Rona. Um, yeah, so the heating of household networks, I mean, household um, housing developments and um, urban communities traditionally comes from costly and inefficient carbon intense uh, heat sources like natural gas and um, resistive electric um, heating. And although heat networks can be um, an effective low carbon solution, um, most of the heat sources they employ tend to be expensive and inefficient, inefficient um, when considered all year round due to system inefficiencies and um, cause reinforcements necessary on the network side. Given this, we, uh, we seek to harness low grade waste heat from the transformers located at um, UKPN's Wandsworth substation in order to enhance the efficiency of um, the heat network at SGN's uh, Wandsworth gas order development, and in doing so, reduce the um, bill costs uh, borne by the end user of the heat. Um, such an innovation, of course, is particularly important at this time, given the um, given the consumers being supplied with gas dependent heat networks um, have been recently experiencing uh, high bill increases, as high as three hundred fifty percent on last year's bills. Uh, next slide, please. So Full Circle um, is committed to providing affordable low carbon heating to a wide range of domestic users by developing a viable technical solution for heat network recovery and integration, which utilizes um, transformer heat losses as a heat source for our district heat networks. Um, in order for the project to be uh, technically viable, we, um, we needed to determine the counterfactual heat losses from the transformers and then um, compare that to that of the development's heat demand to ensure that it would meet the res residents' um, heating requirements. Then we aim to identify the best um, the best heat interface and opt um, offtake options for the project. And once we found this, we, um, we evaluated the overall costs and determined the benefits and risks that will be borne onto the DNO and the heat network. Um, in terms of the commercial viability of the project, we sought to understand what the benefit of the uh, proposed design would be on the end user's bills and what the carbon savings would amount to overall. And lastly, we needed to look into the um, a commercial framework that would work best for the DNO and um, the heat network operator. <clears throat> In terms of the project partners, um, there was SGN Commercial Services, who were the project developer and operator of the proposed heat network and energy center along with their JV partner, Vita Energy. Then we have UKPN, the project's DNO and transformer expert and um, heat, um, heat loss supplier as well. Was, then we had Wandsworth City Council who helped provide input into their LAEP team to inform them on the proposed um, solution. 
And lastly, Arab, our engineering um, partner, provided technical expertise on the project. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of the respective needs of the project participants, um, SGN as the heat network operator required a solution that had a strong technical and um, operational deployment plan. And one that also understood the wider, um, one that also stood the um, business case for the wider development. And of course, um, a solution that could ensure returns on investments for the project and pass on savings to the end user. For the DNO, the project needed to have an understanding of the viable means of repurposing heat losses for the transformers in general, and other locations as well. And there needed to be an understanding of how to ensure the longevity of the solution by um, providing security for the supply of heat losses in the long term and um, putting in place an appropriate commercial um, agreement. And lastly, um, keeping the uh, solution in line with the DNO's regulatory standards. And lastly, um, for the local authority, the solution needed to be one that could be um, applied to other local buildings in the area and one that could help in the LAEP's um, future decision making and its compliance with government planning policies moving forward, um, frameworks such as the key network zoning plan. Uh, I'll now pass on to my colleague, Yuchen. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, as part of the project assessment, I think we, uh, as my colleagues previously mentioned, uh, we look at the uh, technical uh, viability, we look at uh, economic uh, viability, as well as uh, looking at the benefit that we can pass on to the consumers, as well as the, from an environmental uh, perspective, looking at the overall carbon uh, reduction. So from a, a technical perspective, uh, we've looked at four options to uh, uh, recover the heat from the transformers and we've held uh, engagement with uh, UKPN's transformer uh, specialist during the course and uh, uh, in total we look at uh, heat exchanger approaches, there's are two options, oil to water, air to water, heat exchangers. We look at uh, potentially direct contact with the existing transformers, air cooler, and also we've uh, think about using uh, probably organic ranking uh, cycle engines as a way of recovering the heat. And through uh, integrated risk metrics uh, assessment, we uh, kind of uh, uh, find out that oil to water heat exchanger is probably the best way going forward, uh, not only because it uh, performs well against all the different uh, assessment criteria, uh, it also because UKPN has adopted similar technologies uh, to uh, uh, implement uh, uh, active heat removal from the uh, transformer so it wouldn't be completely a uh, new technology to the uh, uh, BAU at the moment for UKPN and on top of that as Kyle mentioned that in order to assess the uh, liability we uh, produced uh, annual heat recovery profiles uh, based on historical load data of the transformers. Uh, we in total collected six years of data including both pre-COVID uh, pandemic and also uh, post uh, pandemic in order to capture the kind of load variations uh, on the transformers. Uh, those uh, input then uh, got fed into uh, uh, SGN and Vital uh, Energy's uh, commercial uh, model to simulate and understand the commercial benefit and the potential carbon reduction. Uh, yeah, next slide, please. Are, uh, so from uh, with date uh, uh, initial economic appraisal. Uh, so in general, we look at it from two sides. From the UKPN side, there's the capex required to implement the hate exchangers, the uh, hate uh, interface provision at the boundary of the uh, substation, and the relevant uh, uh, replacement expenditure and OPEX being uh, considered as well. Uh, and overall, we uh, the assessment shows that. Uh, based on a, a kind of a bulk heat supply and offtake rate around 2.5 p per kilowatt hour uh, would 
make the economic uh, case uh, viable and we're probably looking at about uh, six years of a payback period for the uh, from UKPN's perspective. Uh, on the other hand, uh, quite similarly, we look at the capex required for the hate recovery integration to the SGN development hate network design. And uh, uh, because of the hate recovered is about uh, uh, 42 degrees for the water, uh, which need a bit of uh, temperature uplift in order to be uh, fed into the hate network supply. So that would require a bit of a water to water uh, hate pump to to kind of have that temperature boost so there's the the, the capex involved there and uh, there's a big uh, a replacement uh, expenditure uh, considered as well for the water to water heat pump uh, and also there's the operational uh, uh, expenditure related to them. Uh, so that overall, then the benefit for the UKPN side is, uh, sorry, for the SGN side is really around the uh, displacement of using electricity or potentially gas to uh, pr to generate heat. And there's the, the savings on uh, on the fuel side. Uh, overall, we look at uh, the, the economic case, it's also roughly uh, yields about six year uh, payback period for the investment and uh, uh, overall uh, for both cases uh, we're looking at probably a 30-year NPV value around uh, about a million pounds. Next slide please. Uh, finally, we look at how the benefits are being passed on to the consumers, uh, the residents at the uh, SGN development. Uh, so based on the assessment done by Vital Energy, uh, we know that about 75 or about 76% of the site heat demand can be uh, uh, covered by the recovered heat and uh, based on a uh, kind of a retail rate a customer tariff about 5p per kilowatt hour uh, which would lead to about a hundred pound reduction on the heating bill uh, it, which may not seem to be a, a significant number per residence but uh, if we look at the total bill they is about 300 pounds per year uh, compared to the counterfactual so we are uh, providing about a third reduction uh, to their bills. Uh, so that that's, uh, is a significant part of the, the uh, uh, reduction. Uh, on the other hand, if we look at uh, carbon emission reductions, uh, if we compared to an uh, all gas scenario, uh, we're looking at a uh, 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 carbon reduction around 85%. Uh, whereas if we compare to the actual counterfactual, which is a hybrid system for the heat network, include uh, a gas uh, boiler, as well as mostly the heat would be generated provided by uh, air source heat pumps and over there we can say we can still achieve a 53 percent uh, carbon reduction because the electricity use significantly reduced and we pretty much eradicated any need for the gas uh, boiler next slide please uh, so through the course of discovery, I think the key learnings and uh, 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 how our thinking evolved is around uh, we've uh, had initial appraisal and found out both technically and commercially the scheme would be uh, viable at uh, one's worth. And uh, I think the, the next stage is really to nail down what potentially could be a commercial framework uh, between SGN and uh, uh, all the heat network operator with, with the DNOs. And uh, I think a, a few things went really well during discoveries is uh, we had really good engagement with transformer specialist, uh, with heat network operator, uh, and uh, a few uh, heat exchanger suppliers as well, but all contributed to the success of our discovery phase. Uh, we also uh, went, uh, attended a site visit, which helped to bridge some of the gaps in the uh, 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 recorded data uh, related to the transformer uh, uh, characteristics. Uh, I think in, in the uh, alpha phase, we really would move into detailed design phase where uh, very, uh, closer and in-depth collaboration are expected and I think uh, 
we formed a really good team within Discovery, which we all going to continue for Alpha Phase uh, as the uh, uh, as partners. Uh, I think also we're going to uh, draw in new resources, both from the wider Arab group, from the uh, 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 wider Energies Design team, and also uh, I think well expected uh, UKPN's trans, uh, transformer specialists have a little bit more involvement because we really also want to explore the possibility of using active heat removal, how we can actually imp increase the possibility of increased transformer capacity uh, and also potentially uh, expanding the lifespan of those transformers. Uh, next slide, please. So really looking ahead is we uh, potentially looking at two detailed design, uh, one specifically around the heat recovery system within the substation and also the heat integration design, uh, that is to take heat from the boundary of the substation and integrate that into the heat network at the uh, uh, SGN development site. Uh, we would need to continue uh, stakeholder engagement with transformer specialists, as I mentioned earlier, uh, to say how the active heat removal can actually uh, benefit from an asset perspective, and then maybe potentially even leading to uh, 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 avoided investment cost. Uh, I think from a uh, uh, Relay implementing the scheme at Wandsworth, uh, the K two K frameworks need to be uh, uh, designed. One is the operational and the maintenance framework because we need to make sure the substation is a uh, fit for its purpose to supply guarantee the security of supply of electricity, and also the commercial framework how how heat would be a uh, 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 sell between uh, or trend. The how the transaction should be done between UKPN and uh, uh, the hate network operator. I think another key point, which is also being raised in our end of phase uh, uh, meeting, is around the scale up and the rollout. So we've uh, uh, arranged the plan for uh, a specific activity around mapping out at least for to look at the opportunities within UKPN's area because uh, during the engagement in discovery we know that we're probably looking at uh, around 2000 ish this type of transformers that has really high potential for heat recovery and we need to link that to uh, the heat demand areas the probably the heat network zoning areas as well as potential new heat network development across the uh, the geography uh, next one is uh, UKPN i think uh, would try to engage with uh, off jam to uh, uh, explore the potential regulatory barriers and how we can really implement uh, the DNO for uh, selling heat as a business, as a BAU scenario. Uh, I think uh, through Alpha Phase, we'd like to uh, develop the detailed design to robust stage three and uh, prepare the uh, tender documentations in order to make sure that in beta phase we can procure uh, contractors, DNB contractors to really implement the system. And if successful, uh, we, we believe this may be the first uh, uh, heat recovery from transformer uh, uh, project in the UK. And this would then really demonstrate the potentials and uh, help to de-risk uh, future schemes. I think that's all the slides and uh, well, welcome any questions. Right, so I'll start with Tim's question. What percentage of heat capacity are the transformers currently generating at? Um, so what is there potential for more heat recovery as increasing numbers of heat pumps increase winter peak load? Uh, at the moment, I think the transformers are rated, per transformer, they're rated at 90 MVA, and that uh, uh, full load uh, losses is around uh, not, uh, 500 kilowatt. And if we look at it from the uh, overall uh, uh, losses rate perspective, uh, the four transformers would uh, in total distribute over 1 billion kilowatt hour of electricity per annum. And we're probably looking at around 0.4% uh, of uh, 
that energy being a uh, 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 losses generated, waste heat generated. And, and nice. sorry, and in terms of the winter peaks, uh, I think we, if you look at, we, we had a look at the, uh, the the profiles and compared the waste heat profile and the heat demand, we identified that there's quite a big potential uh, for thermal uh, storage to play a critical role in terms of uh, really uh, maximizing the amount of waste heat that can be recovered. So question from David here, uh, may I ask what assumptions you use for energy prices when doing the commercial modeling, a payback periods, where are the benefits very sensitive to price variations? Uh, I think the electricity price and the gas price are taken from the market price and we've assumed a, a bulk heat offtake rate about 2.5p uh, per kilowatt hour. Uh, we did have a little bit uh, sensitivity analysis around the offtake rate and uh, it would uh, be the, the heat network side would be uh, uh, relatively more sensitive to the uh, bulk heat offtake rate. Uh, but I think we need to uh, further investigate that into an alpha phase with a bit more details around the design and uh, how exactly the heat is uh, uh, fed into the heat network. So another question from David. If one integrates the transformer cooling with the heat network, are there any new failure modes that need to be mitigated? Uh, I think we've designed the heat recovery option with a uh, fail safe uh, 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 idea is even if we don't recover heat, uh, the the transformer oil circulation would always go through its current air cooler. So in that sense, the transformer would then fall back into uh, its current operation scenario. So I don't believe we are creating any new failure modes. And our final question, um, if you're actively cooling the transformers, does this impact the requirement for SF6? Uh, I, I think probably not because the transformer is uh, insulated uh, uh, via mineral oil. So that is where we are extracting the, uh, the heat. So I think overall there's in, in the scheme, there's no uh, SF6 gas involved at all. Okay, well, that brings us to the end of our questions. Um, we'll now move on to our um, final presentation. Um, this chat will um, remain open for a little bit if there are any further questions um, on that former project. Um, so move on to Net Zero Community Energy Hubs. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, I'm Chris Taylor. I'm the Technical Development Director for Vital Energy and going to be presenting about Community Energy Hubs. Um, Community Energy Hubs is a collaboration between SGN as lead partner, Vital Energy, um, Imperial College London and Glasgow City Council and Western Bartonshire Council. Next slide, please. Okay, so the problem this is looking to resolve, um, I guess fundamentally, we need to optimize the use of new and existing energy infrastructure as we move towards net zero. Um, in terms of heating, there has to be a rapid expansion of alternative heating, which is required to decarbonize. The graph on the right shows um, the balanced pathway scenario from the development trajectories uh, for residential heat decarbonization, which informs the six carbon budget. That shows um, 10.9 million air source heat pumps, either communal or individual, um, another 5.3 million ground source of the same and five and a half million of low carbon district heating. In terms of the take up of all of those things, there's, there's many different um, difficult barriers to achieve those targets. Um, heat pumps, for example, require substantial end user investment, which might be difficult to encourage people to do. Um, new forms of heating, such as your heat pumps and, and storage, require customers to make complicated specification decisions with technology that they are unfamiliar with, and, and that is likely to be met with some resistance. Um, 
the grid capacity availability is also likely to constrain development. I think I imagine anyone working in, in the sector understands um, the difficulties at the moment about bringing any new um, grid connected project uh, online and some of the, the, the costs and timings of that, which um, there's currently plenty of work going on to try and resolve. And finally, the existing gas infrastructure is insufficient to be um, changed over to 100% hydrogen. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so our project, um, just to highlight this project um, had a lot of overlap as we went through the discovery with um, cofactor latent heat and some of the things we talked about will come from that project. And as far as the alpha phase application goes, the cofactor latent heat project will be incorporated into this one um, within one or two of the work packages. Uh, so the project is looking to optimize the co-location of, of flexible assets. In particular, this is looking at um, co-locating heat networks with other flexible assets. And the two that we initially considered were battery storage and also electrolyzers with, with hydrogen storage. For the, the heat networks, we considered a, a, a newer type of, of heat network um, that's being developed whereby the primary energy carrier is electricity rather than, than heat. So in that way, a traditional heat network, as many people know, it would be a central heat um, system where the heat is distributed, a central heat generator or, or sort of waste, waste heat recovery system where the heat is then distributed to the end users by a, a water system, a wet system. Um, the heat and generation storage equipment that we're looking at, so the, they're electrically connected um, to, the, to the main point where the central hub is, and then the, the heat generation and storage equipment in those local hubs is, is optimized based on what assets it's connected to. And then we're proposing that gas would be used in these hubs rather than sent to the home directly for, for heat. Um, we considered the system requirements when optimizing the local heating and storage. So there's a balance between how all of the different components are operating. So the battery, the electrolyzer, the, the heat with, with storage. And these are all behind a a single grid connection. So for example, the the sizing of the, the grid connection relative to the battery, it would be 50 megawatt um, grid connection, 50 megawatt installed um, lithium ion battery, and then peak load capacities on the, both the heat network and the electrolyzer also of, of 50 megawatts. Um, this required new advanced control systems to be able to actually manage the balance between all of these different components uh, and make them perform um, commercially viable. Uh, next slide, please. So the technology users, um, we've looked at, I guess, the beneficiaries of the of the technology as well as the, the direct users of the technology. So there is uh, what are the what the heat users need. So they want certainty over their heating and hot water whenever they're required. Um, they want to minimize their spend on new heating equipment. Um, they want to reduce the risk and uncertainty and specification of, of new equipment and things they don't understand. And they want to minimize their ongoing heating costs. Uh, in terms of the asset owners slash operators, um, they want to operate in response to signals from the grid in terms of you know pricing signals mainly. And they want to optimize the specification of those assets to make sure they're not over installing assets that will be underutilized or under installing assets that, that wouldn't meet the utilization requirements. Uh, and then finally, the electricity grid, um, that's sort of transmission and distribution, want a reduction in new infrastructure to deliver electrification of heat, i.e. new grid connections, and they want flexibility within the heat generation. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the project activities. Um, firstly, we did a heat network uh, assessment um, SGN selected one of their sites in Scotland, which um, they're looking to transition. It's a former um, gas holder site, and they're looking for new activities that can be can be done on there. That was the site in Proven. Uh, a heat mapping, a high level heat mapping assessment was carried out um, around the Proven area, and that gave us sort of I guess, potential accessible heat that could be um, explored. That was split into subsectors of health, domestic education, industrial, and then we had I guess, an overall annual um, heat demand figure. 
uh, to develop an actual proper profile for that um, vital energy supply um, provide heat to all those type of customers so we had representative heat profiles for each one and then created an amalgamated heat profile and then we matched that heat profile to the demands of, that were shown in the area so effectively within that mapped area then we had a annual half hourly um, heat profile um, then we looked at how that uh, how a heat network could be constructed to supply that heating and we compared the cost of a traditional central um, heat network with um, water distribution with an electrically distributed heat network and the graph on the right shows um, that the orange line, the lower cost line is the distributed network and the, the higher line is the um, central network. We also did a comparison of the overall power to heat efficiency um, of a central network versus a distributed network. Uh, what the benefit of a distributed network is that the uh, the, the pipe work type of distribution has losses within within the pipe work, and that's more prevalent at the the higher temperatures go, the, the greater the losses will be. Um, so we found that it was um, much more efficient to um, operate this distributed network as there were fewer pipe work losses, sort of we modeled 25% losses versus 5% uh, losses. Uh, and we also did a comparison of the overall heat efficiency of distributed network to an individual domestic customer. The key driver which led that was within heat pumps when you are sizing them for domestic uh, domestic size, you give away a lot of the opportunities to, to optimize the efficiency of, of those units. And as they increase in, increase in size, you there are different things you can add, different things you can do into in the, within the cycle of the heat pump, um, such as recirculation and things like that, which allow you to improve the, the COP of the heat pump. So again, this distributed network had a, an uh, efficiency benefit against individual domestic heat pumps. Next slide, please. Uh, so the next project activity, activity was looking at energy asset modeling. Uh, this was done on the, the project scale. So um, Vital Energy modeled the project using software called Plexos. This is an energy opt an optimization engine, which is used by National Grid to model um, network growth uh, and resilience and, and sort of forecasting of pricing and things like that. Uh, we modeled it on the project level, specifically using a four hour um, lithium ion battery and electrolyzer and a growing heat network. So we didn't just say that you would access all of the, the sort of available heat on day one. We looked at growing over time and as we got towards 2050. Um, what the model can do is it can simulate the real world trading decisions over multiple markets, those being day ahead, balancing mechanism and intraday. Uh, to forecast them, we had a 24 hour, 25 year, sorry, um, price forecast data from um, Beringa and we put that um, information into the, the model and we also use the, the heating data that, that was provided. Uh, so the model optimized uh, at least cost for the whole community energy hub and selects the best way of operating each of those assets. What we found was that the electrolyzer operation was was actually very low and it, it wasn't being utilized within that sort of mix of assets. However, the, the, the battery asset, uh, its business case was maintained. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of the operation of this, um, the, the model, as I said, is it just sort of optimizes how these different assets should should run. And it looks at um, this real world example of effectively putting on trades within the day ahead and then altering those trades through the, the balancing mechanism and then the intraday market to define the, the, the optimum way of running. An example of that being that um, you might say you're going to take power at a, at a certain point but then you sell out of that position um, before the point you generate and you never actually generate, but you can um, access some revenue from that. And that's a, that's a sort of common way that um, batteries operate. Um, looking at how that's done when you've got the mix of assets. So the top right graph shows you the operation of just a traditional DH with a heat pump and a thermal store. You can see, I guess it's quite clear um, and obvious trends. So if you were looking to program something in real life to act as if uh, as if the model had suggested the the um, algorithms involved and the control systems involved in that is going to be simpler. The bottom right graph shows when you have these multiple uh, distributed heat pumps and thermal stores connected with the other flexible assets. As you can see, the 
the um, the relationships are much less clear. Um, and when you're looking at developing a control system to replicate the, the trades and replicate the operation that was shown within the optimized model, you can see that that's gonna be a much more difficult process. What we initially considered doing was directly uh, linking Plexos into the control system. However, because of the way that Plexos um, does the calculation, which is effectively running multiple multiple different scenarios and then selecting what the optimum one is, that was gonna be too slow for the real world calculations. Um, so what we did was we looked at ways that could speed that up. The clear one was into machine learning. So machine learning you is just creation of an algorithm which are a function of a formula, whatever you want to call it, that replicates the output variables for the given input variables. Um, what that can do is be trained using the Plexos software, and then once it's trained up with Plexos, can replicate the Plexos results for these, these, these given designs um, and do so at much faster rates than, than Plexos can. And we reviewed the ability to integrate the um, ML function into the SCAR system. And again, we found that that was a, a viable thing to do. Next slide, please. Uh, further project activities, we're looking at the local infrastructure. So we reviewed the seasonal um, uh, and peak gas supply requirements. Um, we looked at the gas top up requirements in each scenario and we reviewed the impact on the, the gas grid level and the potential for conversion of hydrogen um, with the existing infrastructure. So basically what, what we're looking at is, as we said, sort of optimizing what's there. I think scenarios where there's going to be uh, a scenario where you don't use gas at all will involve extra um, reinforcements done at the, at the electrical grid level, um, which isn't a good um, use of money. Um, what we found though was if you wanted to switch over to completely 100% hydrogen to do all your heating, as if you looked at as the counterfactual, then there was going to need to be significant um, uh, significant in investment into the gas grid to increase the the volume of the pipe work to allow you to meet the the heat levels which are currently demanded in Proven. Uh, so what we did was in our scenarios, um, a gas boiler was available in some of the scenarios as a uh, a top up. And that allows us to balance what the installed capacity of the of the heat pumps is. Uh, and what we found was in all of the scenarios we modeled that the existing gas grid would be sufficient for conversion to 100% hydrogen within the future. And also we did a whole system, um, Imperial College reviewed the whole system impact of, of what we were looking at um, using their integrated whole system model. Um, we compared uh, energy hubs against counterfactual of, of a smaller heat pump, smaller storage and a lower COP heat pump. So that's effectively replicating the, the domestic um, scenario, sort of single domestic user that used the leading the way scenario and deep electrification of heat and compared the generation mixes. And that showed a significant benefit from the increases in the, the COP and, and the ability to have uh, additional storage. And that showed up to 18.4 billion um, pounds of benefit against the, the counterfactual of just individual domestic heat pumps. Next slide, please. So the, the findings, um, uh, the distributed heat networks are advantageous to a centralized heat network rollout. So they savings amounted to about 300 million uh, savings over a 25 year period for a heat network of, of 40,000 homes. Uh, the main benefit of the cost comes from a, you're not having to build a central energy center, so the the um, the, the buildings are, are quite simple, um, and the differential between installing wires to installing wire what wide diameter um, pipe work is a significant cost saving, particularly over the the long distance pipe work that's needed for these um, heat networks. Uh, the distributed heat networks can offer improvements in efficiency compared to individual domestic heat pumps due to the COP benefits from increasing the heat pump size. Um, those benefits are then borne out by um, the grid, you know, reductions in um, peak capacities um, and and reduce necessity for um, some, some generation. Uh, the electrolysis showed very low utilization when co-located with the battery and the heat network. 
our conclusion being that it, it doesn't it doesn't work well within one of the community energy hubs that we're talking about so h2 generation is likely to be better connected at the transmission level and used as an energy carrier um, the logic when we thought through this made sense that you know a large um, part of the benefit of of hydrogen is supposed to be a reduction in the electrical transmission network because it acts as a carrier but if you are generating the hydrogen at the point or near to the point of use then that has to come from you know if, it, if it's uh, green hydrogen that has to be generated and then sent through the transmission network sent to the distribution network and then converted into hydrogen however if it was converted to hydrogen at transmission level or near to the point of generation then that can either be um, piped to, to the site or it can be transported in another way. And again, that sort of is the, the best, what we feel the best utilization of the existing assets on new assets that come along. Um, we uh, found that um, optimized uh, local operation of multiple assets is commercially viable for battery and heat networks. Um, however, this involves complex operation. Um, the key thing that we're looking for here and the key positive of that is there's a number of batteries that are being connected to the, the grid. I think um, one 13.4 gigawatts have of, of battery projects have grid connection offers, which are, are, are live and they will be constructed um, over the next few years. There are constraints on the availability of new capacity, as I said, and I think even new connections now are getting quoted dates into 2030. So if we were looking to connect a heat network, we'd have to wait a significant amount of time to connect that as a standalone project. Um, there'd be cost involved in that and then the system would have to look at um, yeah the additional load on it what we found was that by connecting by batteries that puts us in a position where you can uh, look at these battery projects that have connections and say uh, work with the developer work with work with the owner come up with business models or indeed that those can be purchased and, and developed by the, the the company doing the heat network and that means that those uh, grid connections provide both the, the functionality and the flexibility of the um, of the battery project, and it also allows you to connect to the, the heat network. From the grid's point of view, those two assets can never be operating at the same time, um, and it reduces the need for, for different infrastructure. So in terms of the, uh, the future activities, um, we had various conclusions and then how they would influence our future activities going forward, which I'll rattle through. So um, heat networks can successfully share a grid connection with new and existing battery projects. So we're going to consider business models and discuss with owners and developers for how that could be done in practice. Um, optimal trading and operation of all assets within a community energy was very complex. Um, so we're going to need to train machine learning function using Plexos for integration with the SCADA. Um, this is innovative. Um, we're not aware that anyone does, does this currently. However, it's uh, essential and very achievable, we believe. Uh, there are significant benefits to the whole system from increased flexibility and efficiency within heating. Um, so as part of the future activities, we're going to optimize a heating solution within the local energy hubs to improve efficiency and try and access some of those you know, billion pounds a year savings that Imperial's modeling showed. Um, increased flexibility and efficiency in local hubs allows for the heat network to supply more homes. So again, there's a there's an overlap here uh, uh, between the the benefits to the overall system um, uh, and the benefits to the the local um, whoever's creating the hub, the hub developer, and that is again to optimize the heating solutions for to improve efficiency. Um, these optimized local hubs will likely include multiple types of heat generation and storage. So we're going to bring in the appropriate team and expertise for the next part of the project. And that is where the Cal Factor Latent Heat Project overlaps. And that's the work, in, uh, work package they'll be involved in. And the scale provides greater opportunity for optimization. Um, so it provides better efficiency. So we're going to look at a detailed review of the relationship between heat pump and store capacity, CAPEX and COP to try and identify the sweet spot of sizing. Next slide, please. And just to wrap up then, so the next steps that we'll be looking at specifically as part of the um, alpha um, phase project would be to finalize the optimal equipment specification using using the Plexos software, but giving um, greater detail in regard to the, the CapEx and deliverability of the options that, that, um, that Plexos is saying are, are the best way to go. We're going to run a machine learning process to develop a function that replicates the outputs of Plexos. Um, we're going to select a preferred location for a beta project. Um, what we'll aim to do is a single site, which has multiple heat demands to replicate what a hub would look like, but without needing to have 
have the the scale of that so kind of a ready-made um a ready-made solution um that being potentially a university or hospital or something along those lines uh, we're going to develop a digital tool twin for the preferred location to allow us to simulate accurately how the site would operate when instructed by the machine learn function i think what we realized was no site's going to allow us to take take control of things initially and start and start running these systems and just assuming that it's going to operate within um, within those constraints and we'll look at different protections that we can put on the course of control systems um, to make sure that um, it doesn't exceed any of the, the limits and we're going to look at a detailed review of the business models for co-location with existing batteries i.e do we purchase the the project either a development project or a live project or could you indeed provide the um the, the battery operator with a, a guaranteed um, revenue stream and then you take all of the, the operational and, and um, make the decisions in that regard. Um, that's the completion, happy to take questions. Uh, so I think we are just about out of time for questions, but um, I'll leave this Sorry. open um, so you can answer these questions, Chris. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, so um, we're, we're now wrapping, wrapping up this, um, this session, so I just wanted to remind you of where we are at in terms of the, the programme of other um, show and tell webinars. Um, so the links are, links are here. Um, if you do um, have any further questions um, for myself or for Chris, please do um, pop them in the chat. Um, so yeah, we are, we're at 10 past and we are closing off now, but hopefully we'll see um, you for um, our future webinars um, today and onwards. Thanks all.